Today is November the 21st, 2013. My name is Tanya Fincham. I'm with the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at the OSU Library. And today I'm in Edmond, Oklahoma to speak with Bob Fulton, friend of and colleague of Governor Bellman. And thank you very much for having us today. Glad to be here. Let's start with having you tell us when and where you were born. Okay, I was born in St. Louis, Missouri uh, on uh, September 8, 1931. And my folks, four months after I was born, my dad lost his job and they moved to a rural area where he, they'd both been raised about 100 miles south of St. Louis. And that's where I live now, after having grown up there and then been away for a long time and then come, came back. So southeast Missouri, it's a straight line south of St. Louis, about a third of the way to Memphis. And what were your parents' names? Hadley and Glita uh, Minch was her maiden name, M-I-I-N-C-H, a fairly rare name, a German, uh, uh, kind of a modified German name. And uh, uh, then Fulton, of course, was uh, their married name. And what did your father do for a living? He farmed. Uh, he had, in younger life, had worked in a chicken processing place in St. Louis. That's where he lost his job when the Depression began. And where did you go to elementary school? Went to a one-room rural school, uh, named for my wife's family, the Heitman School, grades one to eight. I went there all eight years, and then uh, uh, when I graduated there, I went to Patton High School. Realize you didn't ask that, but That's okay. Patton, that which coming. is a town about seven miles away, a little bit, uh, quite a small town. High school had less than 100 students in. And did you have a favorite subject? Probably liked history the best. History. Were you involved with 4-H or FFA? Yeah, I had a, we had a 4-H club. Uh, it was started during World War II, and I I suggested the uh, the name for it, and it was. Uh, uh, oh my goodness! Uh, junior Commandments 4-H, junior, junior Commanders 4-H Club. It's a name for kind of a youth a patriotic group. You know. And did you have brothers and sisters? Three brothers. I was the oldest. I had uh, a brother two years younger, and then another one two years younger than that, and finally the third one, the fourth one, was uh, uh, two years younger than the second one, the uh, next last one. Or growing up on the farm, did you have chores? Oh yeah, worked on the farm a lot. Uh, 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 milked cows, uh, fed chickens, uh, helped uh, uh, with the hay harvest and uh, wheat, corn. Uh, plowed uh, corn with a horse because we didn't. When I <clears throat> until I was about, uh, I imagine sixteen, my dad didn't have a tractor, so we always farmed with horses. That's always a good question. Do you remember your first tractor? I sure do. <laughs> Dad bought a John Deere, and it was the noisiest thing. It was two-cylinder, and and uh, uh, he let my one of my brothers crawl on it, and the brother ran it into a the lawn only maple tree in the front yard, and nearly pushed it over. <laughs> it was a tree that wasn't too big, but uh, maybe maybe four or five inches in diameter, and he ran right into it. Poor Dad could get over there and shut it down. He was about to push it out of the ground. <laughs> Was it a new one or a used? No, it was used. Used. Okay. And in high school, you graduated when from high school? 1948. 1948. Yeah. So did you serve in the military then? Yeah. yeah. Uh, first thing I did was teach one-room schools myself for four years. And then uh, in 1952, I got married uh, in, right after this fourth, my fourth year of teaching was over. And then I went in the Army two weeks after we got married. <laughs> So I was in the service for two years. And did you see any action? I did not go to Korea. This was Korean War, and uh, uh, I was uh, picked as part of the permanent party, they called it, at Fort Leonard Wood. So I never got out. I was in the Army two years, didn't get out of my home state. I, was, I went to Camp Crowder and down near Joplin to be sworn in and kind of given the initial taste of Army life, and then to Fort Leonard Wood for basic training, and then stayed there the rest of my time which was, for me, a break. A uh, number of the people in my basic training companies went to Korea. But Did that qualify you for the GI Bill? Oh, yeah. That helped a lot when I got out of service in. I went back to school 
I, in order to teach in those one-room schools, you had to go to summer school. And I also did pick up some additional hours through uh, extension courses, correspondence courses, and and but uh, and you actually the school term would end uh, in uh, April, about the first of April, because they're eight-month schools, and uh, you could go back to a nearby college, Southeast Missouri State at uh, Cape Girardeau. You could go there for half a semester. They'd have courses set up that teachers could take and get credit uh, even though they weren't there uh, uh, for the entire semester. They could start in the middle of the semester and get, get say, three hours of credit. So I was doing some of that. Um, so by the time I went in the Army, I had nearly 60 hours of uh, credit. Then when I came out, I went back to school full time. And then got a degree in education? or I did get a uh, teaching degree in high school education, but I also uh, got a... Uh, Bachelor of Arts, so I, I was the only one that walked across the stage twice, and I, we had our commencement. I, I got a, a two bachelor's degrees at the same time. I did that. I decided I wanted to get a Bachelor of Arts, and you had to have two years language with that. So I, uh, because I needed that, I had the opportunity to get additional courses to let me get those two degrees. So. Uh, I didn't really intend to teach, but I thought, well, it, it's a security um, thing. I have that degree would be a, like something I could fall back on if I didn't get something that I wanted to do worse. So. And what was that? Well, I thought I wanted to work for the government. I actually, uh, when I was in the Army, I don't know it was Parade Magazine way back then or what it was, but I read an article about careers in federal service, and it just stuck with me. That's what I wanted to do. Anyway, uh, uh, and that stuck with me, and uh, uh, sometime in, uh, uh, I guess, my senior year in college, I, I saw the notices posted on the bulletin board for the Federal Service Entrance Exam, and I, went, I took those exams. There, were, there was a couple of categories there you could apply in. I took two exams and went up being hired sight unseen by the Navy Department. And off to Washington, I went with my wife and two children by then. <laughs> and uh, so uh, uh, I went up there to uh, work for the Navy in Washington, D.C. And I went in through what they call the management intern program. It was a training program where you rotated around for six months and then they made, made your assignment. You know, I had a good, a good start with the federal government because they got to do things that a lot of employees didn't get to do, which was to see several different parts of the Navy's Bureau of Aeronautics, who hired me in. So, anyway, uh, but that's how I got into government. It was just really a, a kind of a lingering uh, desire to do that, and it just kind of fell in place. I, I didn't know much about how you go to really about getting a government job, but the, the now announcements they sent out did the trick. Mm -hmm. And then after that, just go ahead and take us through your. Well, through, through well your I uh, I worked for uh, the federal government for 27 years. I started with the Navy, it was uh, Bureau of Aeronautics for three and a half years, then I transferred to the Atomic Energy Commission, uh, which was north, uh, had moved out of downtown D.C. and had their headquarters up uh, in Germantown, Maryland, which was about uh, 25 miles north of Washington. I worked for the Atomic Energy Commission from 1959 to 1967, but one year of that, I was uh, at the Industrial College of the Armed Forces. They sent me there to, uh, uh, Atomic Energy Commission got one person they could send each year to uh, to take this uh, year-long course with uh, senior military people, colonels and lieutenant colonels and Navy captains and commanders. And uh, so I, I had the opportunity to do that. And out of that, I got a master's in business administration through George Washington University. Uh, I should back up a little bit. I went to law school part-time, too. Uh, when I went in that management intern program at Navy, they required everybody to take an outside course, a night course, in something. And I found out that a couple people in the group were going to go to law school. And 
uh, I did a little checking and I found that I could get by by taking a three quarters load of the full load four to four years instead of three for law school, I could use my remaining GI Bill and actually make a little money because it only cost seventeen dollars a semester hour to go to law school at that time at American University. And uh, so I got started before the GI, well, on the GI Bill, then the GI Bill ran out and I was too far into it to quit. So I kept going, not knowing whether I'd ever practice, and it turned out I never did practice. Uh, did a little bit of moonlighting, but uh, uh, anyway, so, so I got that law degree, and then I got the master's, and so here I am, four degrees, probably uh, not sure what to do with any of them. <laughs> but anyway, I worked for the Atomic Energy Commission until uh, uh, 1967. And then uh, I got an opportunity to go to the State Department on a, what they call an exchange program. And uh, I went to, uh, uh, down and worked uh, in the political military affairs section of the State Department in 67, 68. And while there, uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated in April 1968. I was working there. We could look out the window from our offices and see the uh, riot, the effects of the rioting up on 14th Street in Washington. Uh, there's a lot of fires up there. And uh, I'd been kind of restless about being, I was in the Atomic Energy Commission, I was in the military uh, application division, which was the nuclear weapons division. I was doing administrative work. I wasn't a, a scientist, but uh, did administrative work in that division. And uh, I'd been a little restless about maybe getting out of uh, the military side of government. and. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I first filled out my applications for civil service way back in college days, I, I put down the Office of Education as my number one choice. I didn't even hear from them, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, uh, I called up a friend who worked uh, for the uh, poverty program. That was a fairly new program, Lyndon Johnson's War on Poverty. It was called the Office of Economic Opportunity. And I went to lunch with him and another guy I knew who worked out there. And, they uh, they put me on the track of a job in Chicago with the uh, Office of Economic Opportunity. So in 1968, I left the, I still belonged to the Atomic Energy Commission, although I was at the State Department for that year, the previous year. I left there and went to Chicago and worked for U.S. Office of Economic Opportunity, administering community action programs, which are still going today and around the country. Uh, two, there, two years there, and then I got, uh, an opportunity to go to Boston, and the job they offered me was the uh, regional director's job in Boston. In order to take that, I had to resign, uh, renounce, or give up my civil service protections. So I then became a political uh, figure <laughs> of appointment, and uh, because my family had been Republicans all their li all my life, uh, when they did checking on me back in my home area, uh, yeah, they're good Republican, so I passed, passed that. I had to be cleared by the senator for Massachusetts, which was then a black senator, Ed, Ed Brooke, Edward Brooke. And um, he, he gave his clearance for me to appoint, be appointed to that job. So from then on, all my federal service was uh, in the uh, political, uh, it was called limited uh, executive usually, or some language like that, uh, and not a, not a for the most part, not a Senate confirmation presidential appointment, but a, an agency appointment as a, as a political person. That really led me eventually to being connected to Henry Bell. And I'll, I'll, I'll hurry this up a little bit because I can, I can ramble on and on. But uh, uh, So I'm in Boston as the regional director for OEO. In 19 and, uh, <coughs> 1982, Nixon was reelected with a landslide, and uh, he appointed a guy to head the Office of Economic Opportunity, who was uh, 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 really had the job of wrecking the agency. The, uh, the, uh, that office had survived the first Nixon administration because Nixon didn't feel strong enough to uh, to t take on dismantling it. Dismantling Johnson's war on poverty would have been a pretty uh, uh, viewed pretty dimly by a lot of people. But in 1982, uh, uh, what am I saying? Is, am I right? 1982. See, 
wait a minute, I'm gonna, I need to recount my history here. Okay. Uh, Nixon was elected. Uh, Nixon was elected in '68 and re-elected in '72. I'm ten years off there. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, but when anyway, he got that landslide in 1972 over George McGovern, uh, he set out to to do what he wanted to do, and he and Haldeman and Ehrlichman and I think one or two others went up to Camp David and they sat there and they decided what they were going to do and they decided to appoint this guy Phillips uh, with the instructions to uh, dismantle OEO. It was part of the executive office of the president because so, Johnson had kept it close to him and, and uh, Nixon uh, didn't feel comfortable with that. He had appointed a uh, young congressman named Donald Rumsfeld back in uh, in uh, 68 uh, to uh, 69 when he first came in office to run the agency. So Rumsfeld didn't want to dismantle it. He wanted it to mean something and they transferred some things out but he kept it and, and Rumsfeld of course went on to become uh, 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 much higher in the federal government, uh, eventually Secretary of Defense, twice I think. And, but uh, uh, now in 73, beginning of 1973 after the 72 election, we all got in direction to turn in our resignations, including me. <laughs> and, uh, so I turned in my resignation, but in the meantime, Frank Carlucci, who had been a right-hand uh, person to uh, Rumsfeld at uh, OEO, he was appointed to uh, uh, be the Undersecretary of Health, Education, and Welfare. Casper Weinberger was the secretary. And uh, Carlucci called me up one day and said, uh, what have, what have you done to Governor Meacham in Connecticut? I said, well, I don't think I've done anything to him. I, I, uh, uh, we did some work with one of his staff people on some problems down there, but uh, I said, I've never met Governor Meacham. He said, well, he's called Casper Weinberger and wants you to be the director of health, education, and welfare. So here I was being pushed out of one federal agency and now another federal agency uh, being invited to work for. And that's what happened. I. I, uh, I got sent home under my resignation letter for, uh, by uh, OEO, and I was told to wait at home for further direction. We may have you come to Washington and help us out. They didn't outright fire me, that they pushed me out of the job. And then while that was all hanging fire, I got the offer to go to HGW, so I just went and went in another door of the federal building in, in Boston and was there for three more years. So I had a total of six years in Boston, three with OEO, three as a Regional Director of HEW. Then, uh, near the end of the Ford administration, uh, I got uh, uh, acquainted with the Under Secretary of, of uh, Health, Education, and Welfare, a woman named Mar Marjorie Lynch. She came to Boston and she asked me if I would like to be head of the, of the welfare division in uh, HEW headquarters. And this was uh, uh, early in 19, uh, 1976, not too long before the 76 election. And uh, I said, sure, uh, that was a presidential appointment. So I got sent, my name got sent up to the Senate and I got confirmed as the uh, administrator of the Social and Rehabilitation Service. Um, I got, I think my first day on the job officially was like in in June 1976, and the election was in November. Jimmy Carter, of course, was elected over Gerald Ford, and uh, this time I got another, uh, January of 1977, I got visited by, or I visited with the new secretary of HEW. He said, well, we're going to be making change in your job. I said, well, I sort of suspected that. He said, well, we're going to give you some time. We'll have a a telephone and a desk and uh, you can find your job. We'll keep you on the payroll a reasonable time till you can find a job. And that's when I wound up uh, finding a job with the Senate Budget Committee uh, on the Republican uh, staff. And Henry Bellman was the ranking uh, senior Republican on that committee. And uh, uh, I did not see Henry Bellman before I was hired Bob Boyd was the uh, staff director. <coughs> he uh, <coughs> cleared me with uh, the senator, and uh, so I went to work for the budget committee in uh, 
1977. Of course, Henry Bellman was in his second term and was uh, going to be uh, coming back to the farm in 1981. But I got to work with him up there then from 77 to uh, the time he left the Senate. I stayed on at the Budget Committee uh, for a couple of years and, and then, of course, he came out here and farmed and worked at the colleges and wound up working, uh, getting picked by George Knight to go in and be the Interim Director of Human Services. And, and that's when uh, I first set, uh, well, I, not when I first set foot in Oklahoma. I don't know if you want me to go ahead and ramble like no, this. No, you're good. You're doing good. Uh, while I was at uh, HEW in that interim, in that short period when I was the, uh, uh, in the administrator of the Social Rehabilitation Service, Lloyd Rader, the director of human services out here, came to see me. Mm -hmm. He had an issue with, uh, with that department. I do not remember what the issue was, but it was something that was fairly easy to resolve, and I helped work that, get that problem off of Lloyd's back. And then uh, he visited me a couple more times. He was always real uh, interested in uh, what was going on in Washington. He, there was a group of the welfare directors who were kind of like a, a lobbyist group for that, uh, that world. And uh, so Rader had been in to see me. And Henry Bellman, when Bob Boyd asked him if it was right to hire me, he called Lloyd Rader. He said, do you know anything about Fulton? And, uh, and uh, Rader said, oh yeah, he's good, take him. <laughs> so I had, a, I had a, an advocate out here I didn't even know about. And uh, so uh, uh, as the senior Republican on the committee, Henry Bellman controlled the staffing for the Republican part of the committee. The Republicans got like a third of the total slots because the Democrats were the majority. So the Democrats had twice as many staff people, roughly, as, as the Republicans did. But I worked for the Republicans. They got along well with both sides of the committee. And uh, Henry Bellman, though, rather quickly, took me as kind of a personal staffer, too. He didn't have anybody on his personal staff that knew much about uh, welfare agencies and, and their programs. And uh, so uh, that's how I got to be kind of in a special role, because he took, whenever he had something he wanted to do to a, a pending bill or a budget uh, appropriations uh, need of some kind, he would get me involved. And I'd go on the Senate floor with him and write speeches for him and, uh, and stuff like that. And also during that period, Lloyd Rader had me, had uh, he would come to town. Now this is, this is really a, a Bellman special here. He would, <laughs> Lloyd Rader would come to town and he'd have something he wanted to see the senator about. I'd get a call from the senator's office saying, the senator wants you over here uh, to meet with him and Mr. Rader at uh, such and such time. i go over there. Rader always came with a delegation. He'd have three or four people with him. He never traveled alone. He always had these staff supporters. It was costly trips, I'm sure, at the time. But, uh, and we'd sit over there in the governor's office, uh, and the senator's office, and. Uh, Lloyd Rader would expound, and he would go on and on and on. And eventually, Henry Bell would say, uh, you know, I'm going to have to go to this hearing that's uh, coming up here in the such and such committee, or I've got to get on the floor and do something. Bob, would you take these guys over to the, uh, over for lunch and, uh, uh, and have a, uh, let them talk to you some more about these issues. So we'd go across the street to the monocle, uh, restaurant, which was kind of a, a famous restaurant on Capitol Hill, and Lloyd Rader would order a, a martini and a, a, a herring, some kind of a herring uh, uh, plate, and he would make that martini and that uh, herring last for hours, like two or three hours we'd sit there and I'd sort of my I'm at Mr. Rader's disposal. So all during this time, I was learning all kinds of stuff about Oklahoma. Then he had me come out here, and I made a trip around the state visiting welfare agencies. He didn't go with me. He didn't send anybody with me. He just told me to go down to Muskogee, go here. And I don't remember how many places I visited. But uh, so I was, I was kind of being oriented to Oklahoma as I was working for the budget committee. I, I remember one thing that happened down at uh, Muskogee. 
they had a they convened the whole staff. There's like 50 or 60 staff members, I guess, in that office down there, pretty big office. They had them all in this big room, and I was talking on and on about things in Washington, and, and I, I said, uh, do you see any issues that uh, uh, that I could help work on for you? And one guy, one brave soul spoke up and said, well, I think you ought to do something about our pay. We haven't had a pay raise in a long time. And uh, I said, uh, well, really, that's controlled at the state level. We, we federal government supplies uh, uh, most of the money, but the state makes the decisions on pay rates for the people working in, in this agency. And then I went on and said, anybody else got something? And the guy, so help me, one of the older guys in the room, he stood up and he said, whatever Mr. Raider says is all right with me. You know, he didn't want to be identified as being a driver. <laughs> Raider was a power in the state. You, I'm sure you've heard that. I've heard his name a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He was he was in that agency for 31 years, and uh, uh, he, he he did so many favors for legislators that he had a lot of sway with the legislature. They wouldn't touch him. In fact, they kept adding programs to him because there was a dedicated sales tax, a one percent sales tax that had been adopted back in 1937, I think 36 or 37, and it was for the Department of Human Services. And that sales tax grew and grew and grew, and he kept taking on more and more programs because he could pay for them. The legislature didn't have to find new money to cover uh, services for the blind and all these other things that got transferred into that agency. So it became so huge. By the time I came out here, it had 14,000 employees. <laughs> and it was by far the biggest agency in state government. Anyway, I, I better catch my breath and let you figure out whether I've said anything worth keeping. <laughs> No. What was your first impressions of Henry when you met him the first the first time? Oh boy, I got uh, I was hired by the budget committee, and Bob Boyd took me over to introduce me to the senator. And I saw him, and just his physical appearance, great big guy, kind of a florid face, and I thought this guy looks more like a small town banker than he does a senator, and. Uh, I think I made a mistake. He's probably not had a fresh idea in years. Uh, uh, maybe I shouldn't have been hired <laughs> to taking this job because now I'm going to be working with this guy that maybe now, maybe anti, I don't know, anti people would be maybe the wrong word, but people that don't want to do anything about social issues, that's what I thought he might be. Uh, and he didn't, it wasn't what he said as much as what, how he looked. And I thought, oh gosh. And, uh, uh, but it didn't take long before that first impression began to change. And, uh, in fact, before the, my first year was up, he had me writing a welfare reform bill for Republicans to support. And uh, uh, that came about again because of Lloyd Rader's visit with Henry Bellman. And one of those visits I was speaking about, Rader said, they, the Carter Welfare Reform Plan is not going anyplace, and uh, we need we need some things done to the law uh, because we're not going to get this big reform bill through. And they'd been they'd been stuck in the house in a bunch of hassling. Carter did have a major welfare reform bill in his first year, and uh, Henry Bellman said, "Well, why don't we put our own bill in?" He looked at me and said, "You can write a welfare reform bill, can't you, Bob?" <laughs> I didn't do that. I said, well, I'm sure I can get one together with some help. So he went to three other senators uh, and he got staff people assigned to work with me and a team to uh, develop a welfare reform bill for Republicans. And uh, uh, I don't remember what we did in the short run with Bell with, with Raider, Raider's issue. It was a, it was not a, I mean, he wasn't asking Bellman for a comprehensive welfare reform plan, but it triggered this idea to Bellman. So, uh, so we worked and worked and uh, got a staff member from the Congressional Research Service to do the drafting of the language. In early 78, uh, we uh, got a hearing before the Senate. Well, he, he introduced the bill and he had co-sponsors, uh, uh, four other Republicans and uh, one Democrat who was the former Secretary of Health, Education, Welfare, a Abraham Rubikoff from Connecticut. So here, here this Republican senator has six 
co uh, five co-sponsors on his bill, six counting him. And we got a hearing before uh, the Senate Finance Committee. Senator Moynihan was the chair of the Finance Committee. And he was so complimentary of Bellman. And in fact, uh, he remembered Henry Bellman uh, as long as he lived. In the 90s, when uh, they finally passed the big uh, welfare reform bill, uh, Moynihan gave credit to Bellman. Uh, let's see, 78 to 96, that would be 18 years earlier, for having <coughs> uh, presented some, some ideas that were incorporated eventually into the, it had mainly to do with work requirements and uh, trying to target uh, training money on the welfare, uh, welfare recipients. But uh, uh, anyway, that was, that was, the big eye opener for me that Henry Bellman was a a moderate uh, politically. He was uh, socially concerned about the problems of poor people, and uh, Murray was uh, he was a very kind man in terms of how he inter related to people personally. Uh, he was. Uh, the first uh, part of my time with the budget committee, he was the Republican, ranking Republican member, and the chair was Senator Ed Muskie from Maine, who of course ran for president himself. And um, but uh, Muskie was very tough on his staff, and the Democratic staff all envied us who worked for Bellman because we got treated so much, mm -hmm. so much better. Never got scolded in public, for example. Muskie, I heard him one time say to his staff. Can anybody around here outline a, a paragraph? He's talking about his staff not writing well. And, uh, but um, anyway, that was, uh, that was 1977 to 81 when Bellman left the Senate. I stayed on. Senator Pete Domenici from New Mexico became the chair because Republicans took the Senate that year. That was one of the ironies. Bellman would have been chair of the Budget Committee in the Reagan administration had he stayed in the Senate. But he thought 12 years is enough. In fact, I wrote a speech for him that he gave the last day, I think he was at the Senate, about how there should be term limits on uh, members. That it's a shame when people come to the end of their Senate service and don't have a home to return to because they've been in Washington too long. And uh, uh, you might want to find that in the congressional record. That, uh, that was, uh, uh, as I recall it, he proposed a six-year term, one six-year term for a president. Uh, Two, two six-year terms for senators and, and I think six two-year terms for representatives and that would be, they'd be term limited. Uh, and uh, of course an Oklahoman went up there and worked for years on uh, term limits. A woman who had been in the legislature here, Cleta Dethridge, she went to Washington and was the, uh, uh, and headed a national group trying to promote term limits and never got any place with it. Still, have, of course, still haven't done it, but, uh, but Henry Bellman, came back. I stayed with the uh, Budget Committee and then uh, after he had been out here from uh, 81 to uh, 81, I'm, I'm having a little trouble with years here now. He came back in the spring of, in the uh, January of 81. And in 83, in 82, he'd only been back here a year and a half, say, and George and I asked him to take over the welfare department because, the human services department, because Lloyd Rader had gotten into some hot water over youth programs, which is periodically blows up here in Oklahoma, the, the, the uh, child welfare or the treatment of juveniles in the juvenile centers. Uh, and Bellman, I mean, uh, Rader had gotten into hot water and he just resigned announced his resignation January 1, 1983. And uh, uh, George and I, and I know this is not news to you, but George and I got hold of Bellman and said, would you come in and take over the welfare department for a, a while and see if you can figure out what needs to be done to straighten out things there. Bellman then contacted me and asked me if I could get loose from the Senate 
and come down here and help him do a study of the agency. Uh, so uh, I came down here. Uh, I did get a, a basically what amounted to a leave of absence from the Senate. Came down here and, and lived with him near over by Penn Square. He had an apartment down here, and we lived in that apartment. And we traveled the state. We went all over the state, visiting state institutions, county offices, uh, individuals sometimes for three months. And at the end of 1982, we wrote up a report called the Bellman Report on the Department of Human Services. That was, it was all set that he was going to take the directorship on January 1, 1983. And uh, at the same day, he took it off, it took that, he released this report, which called for closing some institution, getting out of the farming business, which was a big deal with Raider. Every one of these uh, uh, juvenile centers and mental retardation facilities had a farm. And Bellman, he concluded they were losing money on the farm. And being a farmer himself, he could look at the operation and see why it didn't work. <laughs> Too much staff. And, and uh, so uh, that was one of the big recommendations. But then there was uh, closing some, prog some uh, centers down and starting to squeeze the staff down. He had a whole, we had a whole array of things that were in the Bellman Report, and he started out to implement them. I went back to Washington then in January 1983, worked again for the Budget Committee, and uh, along about April, he called me and said, well, I've told George and I I'm leaving July 1st. If you want this job, uh, you need to get in touch with Robert White. And do you know Robert? He's at OSU somewhere doing I'll have to look Some kind of stuff. Yeah, you should interview him. Because he's he was instrumental in getting me appointed. Uh, as time developed, as things developed, there was quite a bit of opposition to me being the new director. And uh, the Human Services Commission was nine people. The, the night they voted on me, uh, five of them voted for me, three voted against me, and the guy who was absent was Joe Voto from down in... Uh, Oh, where's he from? Uh, Ada area, I think, down there somewhere. He would have voted against me had he been here. So I, would, I, I squeezed in on a five or four vote, <laughs> really. And uh, but Robert, Robert had carried the water for getting me uh, appointed for George Nye. George Nye went all out. Here he, Nye was pretty amazing. He uh, he was a Democrat, but he saw Henry Bellman as a <clears throat> as a friend, and. Uh, and he knew uh, he knew Bellin was a straight shooter; that there wasn't any nonsense about him, and uh, that he would do what appeared to be right uh, to the best of his ability. And uh, so, uh, uh, that, anyway, he he I came down here finally after they cleared me, and I think I took over July 1, 1983, as a director of human services. And Bellman, of course, went back to farming and teaching, and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, then, of course, at 86, <laughs> he runs again for governor. And, uh, uh, and uh, I, went, I actually wanted to stay at the Department of Human Services, but he asked me once if I'd like to come over and be in the, in, in the cabinet system was new in Oklahoma. It came in at the end of the Nye administration. And uh, I think they passed a bill that actually provided for a, a cabinet system in Oklahoma. For the first time, you know, they had so many state agencies, they were all kind of loosely overseen by the governor. But the cabinet was supposed to be a way of tying the governor's control together better. And, uh, uh, but uh, I said, well, if it's all right with you, I'd really rather stay at DHS. I think the agency still needs some some more work and and uh, but he didn't argue with me and then I found out he told somebody that I'd turned him down for a job over there and I told my wife well, if he asked me to do something again I'm going to do it because I wouldn't even be in Oklahoma if it weren't for Henry Bellman so uh, uh, eventually he asked me again if I'd come over to be the Secretary of Social Services they brought uh, Phil uh, Watson, in, his former senator, in as uh, director of DHS, and I went over to the governor's, over to the state capitol, and worked over there then for the last three and a half years of Bellman's time as the 
uh, really as a glorified staffer, I was, uh, uh, I had eight or nine agencies that I was uh, supposed to help oversee for the governor, including DHS and the health department and uh, the employment security and uh, uh, several little agencies, the Office of Human Rights and the Office of, uh, uh, of um, Handicapped Concerns. There was one or two others, but anyway, uh, so I worked right there uh, as a staff member, really, and uh, uh, attended all of these meetings and uh, worked closely with him in that way. I mean, that's kind of my chronology. It's a long one. I know I can't hold a job. But <laughs> <laughs> well, no, after that, then, once he was out of the governorship, well, did you stay in Oklahoma? No, I, I, uh, I went back to Missouri uh, when he took, left office. It was interesting. David Walters came in as governor. He'd been the chairman of our Human Services Commission the last couple of years that I was that uh, I was there, and uh, he didn't ask me to do anything in state government, and I didn't ask him for a job. I uh, I uh, just uh, decided. My wife and I decided it was maybe a good time for me to take get out of government. So I left uh, state government after eight years here, and. Uh, we moved back to Missouri, where we had built a house a couple of years before, thinking that we might live there full time, or we might use it as a kind of a family gathering place. And uh, so, when this, uh, when the administration changed, and uh, Price, Bill Price, ran a poor race for governor to succeed Bellman uh, and Walters, swamped him, I think, as I recall that election, and. Uh, I think Walters liked me all right. I suppose if I'd asked him for a job, he would have given me one, but I didn't do it. And uh, of course, he got into deep trouble over campaign uh, finances, and, and uh, almost got uh, sent, almost got indicted. I think they indicted him on a misdemeanor, and, and he was able to keep his office. But uh, 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 anyhow, the uh, so that's the point. We went back to Missouri, and I. Consulted. Uh, I had a connection to a, a National Center for Children in Poverty in, at Columbia University in New York, and I made, was on the payroll for them on some consulting work. And then uh, later, I got put on their council, the, their governing council, and uh, I made many trips up to New York over the next several years. I also worked for the National Academy of Public Administration on a couple of projects, and I had things going pretty soon in community work here in Missouri, so I was real busy. But after a, a while, that was 91, and we started that period, uh, I told my wife, you know, I'm pretty good at finding work, but I'm not very good at finishing these consulting projects. I never felt real good about how I tried to tidy up the loose ends at the end of the project. I think I just might as well have a regular job, so I went to work for the, I, went, I applied for the director uh, of one of the community action agencies, same agencies, type agencies I'd funded back in the OEO days. Now I went to work for a local one, so served in eight county area in my home area. And I did that for four years. I told the board of that agency when they hired me that I'd, I would stay a minimum of four years, but I wouldn't promise staying longer. When the four years were up, I left that. And since 1999, I haven't been paid for anything I've done. <laughs> but I've been very busy. I've been involved with lots of community stuff. Right now, I'm uh, a president of a little foundation that uh, is uh, renovating or is developing programs for uh, and renovating and developing programs for two uh, historic college buildings in the uh, in Marble Hill, Missouri, which is the county seat of the county I live in, and. Uh, uh, this takes a good deal of my time because we were, uh, I, I was succeeded in getting a, a, a major uh, funding uh, grant from the state, their, their tax credit program, and uh, we got money to work with and we're rebuilding one of the, re renovating one of the buildings now. We have a museum operating in the other one and still have some renovation to do in it. And, uh, so that's, that's my major community activity in, in addition to church work. I'm involved with two little Methodist churches there. Actually, we were out, out of strange cir circumstances. I'm chairman of the church council in both churches. I go, I go and hear two sermons every Sunday. Uh, the, uh, the same preacher preaches at both, and I'm just telling him I'm fact checking to make sure he 
it doesn't tell anything in the second service that he, that he didn't tell in the first, or didn't, not that he didn't tell anything different. But anyhow, that's my life, and uh, I've enjoyed I've enjoyed retirement tremendously. Unfortunately, got enough income to not to have to work, so uh, we're. Uh, I'm a triple dipper from the standpoint of federal ret and state retirement. I got a small uh, uh, retirement from out here, my federal years, and then I've got Social Security. Thanks to working out here, my Social Security benefits a lot better than it would have been, because out here you're covered by both the uh, in Oklahoma employees covered by both Social Security and state retirement, and that made a huge difference in my Social Security for me and my wife both. Anyway, well, once you moved back from. From here back to Missouri, did you stay in touch with? with yes, mm -hmm. and at OSU, we created. A, I helped him create, and I did the incorporation stuff, and and, uh, and we developed this uh, Oklahoma Center for Public Policy Research, and uh, uh, I did a lot of work with him on that. We got money. From, we got uh, somebody to slip some language into a. a, a committee report uh, on the EPA appropriation and we were able to get uh, an EPA funded project on uh, uh, converting uh, uh, plastic waste uh, to a more usable product uh, and uh, uh, the uh, Kimber this was tied in with Kimberly Clark paper company, and I don't remember how the Kimberly Clark uh, connection all got established. But when they wrapped uh, uh, paper towels or toilet tissue uh, with plastic wrap, they would clip off. They would always have uh, waste plastic, and there was a big problem on how to how to get that uh, plastic processed. And uh, uh, if they could get the ink off of it, it would be uh, worth a lot more than with the ink on it. In fact, with the ink on it, it was basically uh, not usable. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we had a team of uh, people from OSU, Tulsa U, and, uh, and OU uh, convened by this uh, Bellman Public Policy Research Institute to work on that project. We had a couple other projects too. There was one on uh, on. Uh, Cogeneration uh, using uh, 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 gas heat to generate elect I mean uh, uh, generators uh, run by uh, uh, where you're heating a building to uh, uh, try to get double use out of the heating source to, to generate steam and uh, and uh, make uh, turbines run and that sort of thing. But uh, Henry Bellman felt that. He had three comprehensive universities in Oklahoma, two public, one private, and that there ought to be better uh, interconnections between them. He'd run into a couple things while he was governor, I think, that uh, indicated to him that these people didn't know what each other were doing. And uh, so we tried to do that, and I worked with him. He had an office there at OSU, uh, uh, and uh, eventually, Boy, I'm going to blow this guy's name down. He hired a retired general. Uh, Goodberry. Goodberry. General Goodberry. Yeah, you know him. You, you talked to him? The okay. younger one, the son. Yes. His son? Yeah. There for a while I was confused about which one I actually worked for. I've done the, 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 younger, the younger son, the younger Goodberry. The older Goodberry had something to do with OSU too, but I think it was the younger one. Okay, well this guy wasn't real old, it was, uh, and I knew him, and I haven't had any contact with him for quite a while, but uh, but he kind of became the, the operator of the uh, institute. And then eventually, I think uh, Henry Bellman gave up on the idea of it. Well, we, we spent a lot of time trying to convince the presidents of the three universities that they ought to incorporate this as, a, as an entity that they ran that they mm -hmm. took it over and actually made it part of, of the university structure. Uh, the uh, Oklahoma uh, of OCAST, Oklahoma Agency for Science and Technology, uh, we tried to cozy it up to them and uh, it just didn't, it was too different I think from the way universities were operating to 
never get really embraced by them, and uh, it just kind of faded away eventually, I think. General Goodberry tried to keep it going, but uh, uh, it, uh, it kind of faded away. But we had, I had a lot of contact with him. We, uh, he'd call me periodically, even after that was over, and uh, we'd talk. Uh, of course, I met Eloise and uh, went to uh, visit with them a couple of times. And, uh, uh, we, I brought a group out here and we all visited them at, him at the museum up in Billings. And, and, uh, I was going to ask you if you'd been to the farm. To, yeah, I've spent, farm. I've spent, I think I spent one night there with him. I've been to the farm numer numerous times, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, went to his, uh, I don't know what they had there, 85th birthday party maybe. He's, t he's exactly 10 years older than me. I was born in September. Uh, 1931. He was born in September 1921, and so uh, I always remembered his birthday. And uh, we came out here. My my son, daughter-in-law, went to that same event uh, that was held out at the farm, uh, kind of a reunion a group for staff and people that had known him. Did you do much interaction, like the social interaction, with him in D.C.? No, no. Uh, he and Shirley, uh, they weren't part of the of the party scene there at all. They were. They were living a normal life over in Alexandria, Virginia, and uh, uh, now Shirley was involved with some other wives there in uh, some business ventures. I think they renovated some houses, and uh, and they had something else going. Uh, of course, when she got back here, she ran a big craft operation. You know, she was part of stimulating home crafts in the, in Oklahoma, and uh, uh, she had she was a I think she was a really smart woman and, and could have been a major figure in the business world if she'd chosen to work in that world. She was, she was smart. She had an eye for what might be, be uh, attractive to the consumer. And uh, uh, so she had quite a few people working for her at one stage. Making, I don't remember what they were making, but they were making stuff. She did dolls for a while. Dolls, dolls, yeah. That was one of them, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, her dad, of course, was a huge shock to everybody that knew her. And, just uh, uh, seemed seemed uh, so untimely. She was. They were having a good, pretty good life on the farm. Mm -hmm. yeah. but anyway, well, those three months that you lived with him, do you have any any interesting stories from from? <laughs> well, not so much from the living arrangements. We were uh, we didn't eat much there. We uh, get get a bowl of cereal for breakfast, and we were gone then all day somewhere. Uh, but uh, uh, on the road. It was really, uh, really great. I, I should have done what you're doing. If I'd had a tape recorder that I could just flip on when he got into one of his stories, I would have had some priceless stuff because he told me all kinds of stories. As we go to a different county, he would remember something from his campaign in 1966 or from his campaign in, what year do you remember the Senate? 19... Oh gosh, I better not try to say the year. Uh, he was at, he was just out of office two years, I think, when he ran for the Senate. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but he would have a story about something that had happened there. Maybe the so and so was a bellman bell and mm -hmm. and uh, had become a good friend. Uh, and uh, one time we went to see Oral Roberts. Uh, the, uh, this may have been after he was governor. I don't think it was. I think it's why we were making these rounds. Oral Roberts wanted to see him. So we went and had dinner with Oral up in his, up in his uh, post near heaven up there. And, uh, at, uh, and uh, at the uh, uh, dinner, uh, he presented Henry Bevel with an Oral Roberts family Bible. I'll never forget this. Uh, I was driving, we got in the car, and Bevel flipped this over and said, Well, look here. Where they usually have Bible pictures, uh, it's got the Oral or Roberts family. It truly is an Oral Roberts family Bible. <laughs> but anyway, that same time, he told me the story about uh, in 1966 uh, when he was running for governor and had no campaign money. Uh, he got invited to uh, a meeting over there in Tulsa with uh, some people. And I, I think it was insurance industry. I'm not positive it was insurance, but some industry group. And they told him about this bill that was pending in the legislature, but they really wanted to become law. And they told him if he would um, agree not to veto the bill, he didn't have to sign it, if he just let it become law without his signature, that uh, if he'd promised to do that, 
they would make an immediate gift of $100,000 to his campaign. And he walked out of there without, he said, I can't agree to that. I haven't seen the bill. I'm not going to do it. I can't make that kind of commitment. And uh, uh, I know that was a true story that uh, that had happened to him. But, but there, was, there were little stories, big stories, almost all parts of the state of things he had been involved in. And his memory was really sharp about that stuff. I can't remember the stories now except for one or two. And uh, but, uh, but he was uh, he was a man of great integrity. I uh, when I was uh, coming into uh, DHS in uh, early '83. Um, well, and just I guess he he stayed over maybe a month, overlapped with me when I came in. And he was still the director until the end of. Uh, of June of 1983, and uh, uh, during that time, the Nursing Home Association sent in some of these little pocket diaries, you know, the, where you can keep a record of your appointments and, and phone numbers and whatever you want to carry. Sent a whole box of them. He made us send them back. He said, I don't want to be beholden to those guys for anything. <laughs> because they had, they knew they were going to be visiting with me pretty soon about rates paid for Medicaid uh, nursing home patients. He said, we don't want to take anything from them in the way of a gift. So most agencies, of course, they just hand them out to the staff, but not Henry Bellman. He was, he was straight air all the way. He was the most honorable, honest man uh, uh, that you can imagine. He was, he was absolutely above board with everything. And uh, uh, he, he was really uh, uh, kind of, I guess you'd say he's, He's the opposite of uh, the public perception that all politicians are on the take in some way and trying to po uh, line their own pockets for public service. But that certainly was not true of him. Mm. Uh, yeah, he's uh, he was my mentor. I I feel I, I you know he took me under his wing at the Senate. Uh, I'd been in a senior job in the, the senior jobs in the uh, executive branch, but. Uh, I never worked for Congress, and uh, uh, he was uh, he was a very good person to learn from. And uh, of course, out here, uh, when he went back to uh, doing other things, and I was at DHS, I would call him up periodically and say, "What do you think I ought to do about this or that?" And he always had sound advice. Most of the time, he'd say, "Well, do what you feels right." <laughs> In '86. And later in '87, I moved over to work in the Capitol. He was uh, uh, always involved in me in something uh, uh, that uh, didn't really have much to do with the, uh, the job I had to, uh, officially. But one time he called me up and said, uh, uh, Eunice Shriver is coming out here. And we're, I'm trying to figure out a way to get some money from the Shriver Foundation, or maybe it was the uh, Kennedy Foundation. She was involved with her two or three of the Kennedy family uh, enterprises, and then uh, said, "I'm trying to figure out a way to get some money out of her to pay for this and that. I'd like you to go to lunch with us." So uh, uh, the staff over at the Capitol, the ladies at the, at the mansion, the ladies that fix the food, they were all a flutter, of course, because the Eunice Shriver is coming, and uh, they. Uh, uh, trying to figure out what to serve. And Henry Bellman said, let's serve him some of those quail that I brought back from the last hunt. Henry Bellman loved a quail hunt. And uh, he'd go out with Jake Pickens and uh, whoever else had a, had a hunting place and uh, come back with quail. So he had a bunch in the freezer. And, uh, and uh, the, uh, so he, he had that served for lunch. And uh, before lunch, they got, they got a message from Eunice Shriver's assistant that uh, Eunice probably won't eat anything uh, much. She really is kind of a real picky eater, doesn't eat hardly any. And she would like to have, uh, oh, what's the French uh, uh, bottled water? Uh, Avion, I think, uh, one, one of the bottled waters that's got a French name. She'd like to have that. And uh, uh, just plain, doesn't need ice or anything, just just plain. 
Well, the staff trying to be uh, uh, really uh, efficient, uh, really uh, accommodating, they freeze this bottle of water, uh, Avion or whatever it was, and make ice cubes out of it. And so when we sit down to lunch, here everybody has a glass of this stuff with, uh, with frozen ice cubes in it, including Miss Shriver. Uh, they thought they were making it really especially nice by, by having the ice made, they made it out the same. Well, she wouldn't touch the water. But the quail, she ate like it was going, to, uh, going out of style. She just, uh, she ate two or three of those things and she asked Henry Bell, do you mind if I put one of these in my purse and take it back? That is really good. <laughs> <laughs> Here, this, uh, <laughs> this rich, I know he wants to carry a quail from Oklahoma back in her purse. <laughs> so uh, this, her staff was wrong and the governor's staff were both wrong and didn't have it all figured out. So. <clears throat> Another story from the mansion. Uh, Henry Bell Bellman got invited to something at night downtown. They wanted me to go with him, and their wives were supposed to go. So, so I said, well, I can drive down there, because, you know, he didn't take security with him. It's a whole different deal now. But, uh, so uh, we went over to the Capitol, over to the mansion, to pick him up. And uh, Henry Bellman had just had his foot injured. He'd been up on the farm working cattle. And a cow had kicked him or stepped on him, and he had a real bad foot. He could hardly walk on it. And uh, like I am now, I'm having some back problems, but he, he had major foot problems. And we got to the mansion. I said, Governor, you need to sit up front here with your foot. Let the wives ride in the back. He said, I'm not doing that. I said, well, it'll be easier on you. No, I'll sit back here with Shirley. So they crawl in the back. And going down the road, he says, uh, you know that... Uh, uh, if the uh, husband's right in front and the uh, wife's right in the back, that's lower class. He said, I really don't want to be lower class. Uh, he said, if the uh, uh, people ride with their own spouse, that's middle class. And if the uh, uh, husband and the other wife ride in front, the other guy's wife ride in front together and the other couple's in the back, that's upper class. He said, I don't want to be upper class either. <laughs> but he was wonderful. There was so much uh, uh, humor about him, really, but uh, uh, he was, uh, he was just, uh, just a super guy. And uh, I was uh, blessed to, I am blessed to have known him, been close to him for quite a few years, and learned a lot from him and uh, miss him. I miss him a lot. People whose paths crossed his have changed for you know, just altered yeah. completely. It seems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was certainly certainly true with me, and uh, I was grateful for having had the opportunity to be associated with him. And I felt like uh, I felt like he's so special that uh, my life was was enriched by being with him. Yeah. And, and what was your wife's name? Maxine. Maxine. Yeah. Yeah, Maxine and Shirley, they, were, they liked each other too, which was really, really good. And uh, uh, we are, we still talk about the Bellmans uh, quite a bit. And, uh, Any stories about the girls? The girls were not really very visible during the years that uh, they, were already, yeah. they were already out on their own. And I did see more of Pat than any of the other two. Uh, I knew Gail and her husband and Enid. Uh, uh, and, uh, but Pat was married to a guy, uh, Dick, uh, oh gosh, can't think of his, his name, Dick somebody. Uh, and, uh, uh, and we got to know him as well. And they were around the farm some when I visited up there and we saw him at other times. Uh, but I never really got to know Gail and Ann very well. And uh, I mean, I was interested tomorrow. They're, at noontime, they're going to be interviewed by a couple of uh, by one of the journalists about uh, their dad. Mm -hmm. They're all three be there. That'll be a that'll be classic and be really interesting. And, uh, uh, I know that Pat became a minister later on, and uh, I don't know what she's doing now. But. They're on the farm. Yeah, they. Uh, that's right. She and Gail have some kind. All right, she and Ann have an operation out there, trying to run a retreat center or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Have you been out there? I have. Yeah. Good. 
Have you interviewed them? I have. Well, good. You're doing a good job on this. It's fun, and it's been interesting to learn about him. To his yeah. his character, just we need more of more people like him. Yeah, yeah. Well, he was courageous. He would, uh, uh, you know, he didn't mind bucking the Republican leadership. But he, at the time he was there, the uh, uh, the majority leader, at least for the most of the time that I was working for the Senate, was Harold Baker from Tennessee. You know, because you're Tennessee roots. Howard Baker was a moderate. He was far from the right wing of the party. And uh, uh, in fact, his uh, the staff guy that he assigned to uh, work with me on that welfare project was Rob Mossbacher uh, from Houston. His dad uh, had became Commerce Secretary, I believe, in the, in the Reagan years. And uh, but. Uh, uh, but Baker himself hired hired staff that was uh, not not connected to the hard right of the Republican Party. There weren't wasn't a huge number up there at that time. They were in that kind of that camp. Uh, Jesse Helms from from uh, North Carolina was one that was really far over to the right, kind of uh, not not very sympathetic to people programs like welfare and food stamps and so forth. And, and Gordon Humphrey from uh, uh, New Hampshire in that, that league. And there were others, but uh, for the most part, the Republicans in that era were much more much more moderate than the current crop up there. And uh, so it was easier for Bellman and Muskie to work together than it is today for uh, uh, Patty Murray, and I forget who's the ranking Democrat on that. Uh, I mean, who's the ranking Republican on that budget committee? Uh, but it's tough for them. And then, of course, Paul Ryan is chairman of the House Budget Committee. And now, right now, Murray and Ryan are having trouble getting any kind of a unified uh, federal budget worked out. And, uh, and, and, and uh, the era that I worked for the committee, and Bellman was there, and even after he left, uh, uh, Domenici chaired it. We always had a, an agreement on a budget resolution that went to both bodies and it got approved. It was sort of like a guide for the for the uh, uh, appropriations committees in terms of what they could, could appropriate. They they made the detailed decisions, but the overall was done by the uh, budget committee. And uh, today it's not they haven't had a budget agreed to now in four or five years, and uh, it's it's pretty sad. Washington is broken in many ways, I think. Um, Senator Muskie had voted against Henry Bellman in the, uh, uh, in the election challenge on his second term. Uh, of course, Bellman won that challenge, but it was a narrow vote. I, have you looked into that at all? Have anybody talked about that? People, oh, just a little bit, not, not uh -huh. a great deal. Uh, I didn't know Henry Bellman at that time, but uh, uh, Muskie had voted against him, and I'm sure it took a some courage for Henry Bellman to then become almost like a buddy of Muskie's in working on the budget issue. They were very, very much uh, uh, connected to each other. Didn't get super partisan on the budget committee until after Reagan was elected and uh, the Republicans took uh, control of the Senate in 1981. Then it was partisan. Uh, well, he crossed party lines quite a bit. Oh, yeah. Henry. Yeah, yeah. He was. Uh, and he appointed, uh, was it Hannah Atkins? Oh, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Sorry you didn't get to interview her. She actually did, did but not did about you? him, about her service in the legislature. Oh, did you? Did you? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she he appointed her to be the, the cabinet secretary for uh, uh, aging and uh, uh, mental health. I don't remember what else, but she was, uh, she was a colleague of mine on the cabinet. The tea sipping lady. Tea sipping. Well, she, she referred to herself as the tea sipping. Did she? <laughs> well, she'd of course been a, a UN. I'm sure she told you about that. She'd yes, been assigned she as a part of the American delegation to the UN. And uh, yeah, I, I considered Hannah a real friend. Sandy Garrett. Have you talked to her? Mm -hmm. Sandy Garrett was brought in by Bellman to be the uh, uh, Secretary of Education when the, he structured his cabinet and. Uh, she uh, stayed with that, uh, and they passed uh, in that uh, uh, 
I don't remember what year it passed, but House Bill 1017, the big educational reform bill. And Sandy was in the middle of that, uh, not only before the bill passed, but all through <coughs> the uh, period of early implementation. And she stayed on, of course, for a long time as uh, Commissioner of Education and Secretary. She'd be worth your time. Uh, she's going to be on the program down here at, uh, at the uh, History Center. And uh, it, would be, uh, it would be great for uh, you to talk to her. Well, he was very good at finding the right person for the right job, regardless of what party they were. So. Well, he would stick with people. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of people didn't feel that Hannah contributed a lot in the cabinet, but uh, he wasn't about to replace her. And, uh, Loyalty was important. Yeah, very important. And uh, of course, um, Don Farrell, who was secretary of I don't know what his title was, he had the uh, kind of the law enforcement and uh, military side of the state government under him. He was the adjutant general for the state. But he had worked for Bellman in Washington uh, in the first uh, senatorial term. Became an editor of the uh, well, became owner of the paper in Chandler newspaper. Uh, he's going to be on the program down there too. And, uh, Were you surprised when he chose not to run for a senator at that third for the third term? Uh, no, uh, he had made noises to the staff about uh, he thought he'd been there long enough. There were a lot of people crying about it, and his staff. And of course, they were expected to be out of a job, some of them, but. Uh, well, I mean, he could, and he could have run for governor another term. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he was just, uh, that was just his attitude. I think he felt that when that, that education reform bill um, got enacted, that he had done his big yes, thing. Sir. And, uh, of course, he came in, uh, the state was still trying to recover from the recession of 1982-83. Uh, about the time we started our study of, in the, uh, the fall of 82 of DHS, the Penn Square Bank failed. I think it failed like in July or August 1972, 1982. And uh, Oklahoma went into a deep uh, uh, a downturn. We had, uh, I think the first full year I was at DHS, for the first time in history, the spending of that agency went down. Uh, uh, it wasn't because we, the need wasn't there, because we had to trim programs to uh, uh, to live within the sales tax revenue because it was going down. And uh, uh, so if you look at a table of DHS's annual reports, they've always got this historical uh, um, uh, table in the back that shows year by year what the total spending was. And in the mid-80s, it was down. Uh, and. Uh, uh, then, of course, they start transferring agencies out to about, uh, I don't think anything transferred out before I left, but a whole bunch went out later. They transferred re uh, uh, vocational rehabilitation out to a new department, transferred the teaching hospitals out. We had them under our direction when I was there. Hmm. And, uh, uh, and it, uh, uh, so the DHS is probably uh, Maybe a little over half as big as it was when uh, I came in. There were 14,000 employees. I don't know what DHS, DHS's total staff is now, but I, I would imagine it's about half that, something that range. Anyway, I, I probably told you about all I know. Well, what would you say one or two of his major impacts were on this, or the, the state or the country, either one? Well, his vote on the Panama Canal Treaty uh, was, was a huge national impact because he was a swing vote. Uh, he voted to, uh, to uh, support that treaty, and it was highly controversial. He, uh, uh, he made a speech on the Senate floor about uh, how uh, if we didn't turn that canal over to uh, the Panamanians, we were going to be uh, constantly having to put down revolts down there. Uh, and. Uh, that it was not a healthy thing for the United States to insist on dominion over the canal zone. And uh, so uh, uh, his vote was crucial on that. He got 
Oh, terrible criticism out here. I think that had a lot to do with him having a narrow squeak in his election against Edmondson uh, in, uh, for his second term. Uh, he, uh, uh, Oklahoma, called him, called him Benedict Arnold. Uh, the, there were, he, he came out to go home as he drove up the road to, from the airport. There was or somewhere toward the farm. There was a Henry Bellman uh, 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 rag doll hanging in a tree by the neck. Uh, and uh, uh, I mean, it was a real act of courage for him to make that vote. It was highly controversial. And I guess I'd have to say the uh, uh, kind of the bringing DHS back under control of the state was another big accomplishment that uh, he had a big hand in. Uh, under Raider, it pretty much operated independently, and Raider had his own political network. He had a he had a book of favors. He had a his, his secretary of era. Alder kept a, a log of favors done for legislators. And whenever some would get involved in regular one down the legislature, he'd call somebody and say, Now you remember when we hired so and so down there? Uh, you said you'd help me out in anything that uh, I needed and I need your help now. Then uh, he'd call in those favors. But uh, Bellman basically helped, helped break that. I, I was involved in doing that too because not long after I got here I had a staff meeting and well, somebody asked me, what should we do when a legislator calls? I said, well, you should be courteous, you should take the question or the request, you should tell the legislature you get back, legislator you get back to him. But I said, a call from the legislature is not supposed to trigger immediate action any more than any other. Uh, citizens call, and uh, of course somebody went over and told uh, some people in the legislature that I'd said that. So I got called over by Don Mincer, who was the chair of the Human Services Committee. And I understand you told people they didn't have to pay attention to legislators' calls. They went, no, Mr. Chairman, I didn't say that. I told him what I'd said. He said, well, I don't like you signaling people that we aren't important. I said, well, I didn't do that, I don't believe it. But anyway, but that was the, kind of the atmosphere of uh, people feeling that Mr. Rader was almost like work for them rather than for the Commissioner of Human Services or the governor. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Rader helped to create that kind of atmosphere. But uh, uh, the other thing, of course, is that Education Reform Bill, 1017. That was his... Uh, his big accomplishment in terms of domestic pol I mean, the state policy and, and, and support of public education. And, and uh, uh, he had a remarkable effect with, with those, uh, and getting that bill through. Because it was, it was, again, highly controversial. People felt like the state was taking over too much control of local schools and the usual needs. And, but, uh, mm. Interesting how his mind worked too. He just liked to be able to know more. <laughs> he could come up with ideas. And I think when he's driving he the tractor, he once told me that he could drive the tractor all day without having to, without having to stop for the bathroom break. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, you got a lot better bladder than I have. <laughs> uh, but uh, he was thinking all the time. He was riding that. Uh, uh, Tractor. He'd come in and call some staff member and say, "I'd like to, I'd like to look into this and a uh, brand new adventure of some kind." And uh, uh, he was. Uh, uh, I'll tell you one thing: the uh, uh, government was was clean in his era. There was no uh, uh, fraud or kickback or anything going on. If there hadn't been that person; would have been long gone. Yeah. But, uh, and he was an early riser. Oh yeah, yeah. He got up before the chickens. <laughs> There was a story in the legislature that Don Draper was the Speaker of the House, and he said, uh, of course, he was known as hitting the bottle pretty hard, and, uh, and uh, somebody, I think, for the Tulsa World wrote this thing and said, as Don Draper was arriving home, Henry Belmont was getting up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, have you seen that famous picture of, of uh, Belmont in the gallery when George Nye was making his inaugural, uh, his uh, uh, inaugural speech, or his first speech, uh, 
1983, when Bellman was just taking over at DHS, he was up in the gallery listening to George Nye's uh, State of the State speech, maybe, to the legislature. And they caught a picture of him, sound asleep, just sprawled out there <laughs> looking. <laughs> and that picture was, uh, was a wonderful picture. Uh, I've been told that he may have not have been asleep. He just looks looked like he was asleep. <laughs> I think he was asleep. <laughs> he didn't have it. He could drop off pretty quick. <laughs> I, I relate to him on that too because I had the same problem. <clears throat> There's a cartoon that the Oklahoma published when I first came out here. Uh, of course, Robert Fulton, I, I got called Steamboat part of, at different times by different people during my life. and. Uh, and uh, because of Robert Fulton getting credit for inventing the steamboat. And uh, they showed a picture of DHS being a ship, and it was up on the rock. And the steamboat's got a problem. <laughs> DHS is, is in trouble. So. <laughs> anyway, I have a lot of good memories from Oklahoma. As I said uh, before we started recording, I, I considered this a really great place to live. I loved uh, our time here. And uh, there were some tough, tough days in DHS, but uh, and uh, but I had a great, great experience. And you consider him your mentor? I do, I yeah. did, and I do. Yeah, he got me, uh, made me a, more than a, I deserve to be a, a a good staff member for him. I mean, a close staff member to him at the Senate, and then out here. Uh, of course, at DHS, and then later working in the governor's office, uh, uh, he was there and uh, a strong supporter, but also someone that uh, could tell me when he thinks thought things ought to be done differently. Did you ever campaign or have him campaign? No, I didn't have to do that. None of that. Okay. Were you present at the election on election night at his campaign headquarters or anything? Any memory from that? No, I don't think I went to that. I don't know why I didn't. I went to the uh, swearing in out on the Capitol grounds, and that was quite an experience because the Supreme Court uh, Chief Justice, whose name I don't remember, he got tangled up on the oath, and he kept stumbling over uh, over the words. And he said he put mother in there where it's supposed to be other, uh, other. Uh, I forget how that all goes. Other uh, evasions or something like that. Well, he kept saying mother. He said it two or three times. It got to be comical, but uh, Burns Hargis, he was involved somehow in the in the um, ceremony. He got up and said, "Well, we heard about Mother now." <laughs> Do you remember more? Did you think the little things trigger? Oh, I don't know. It's uh, it's amazing how many memories. Uh, God, I'm sure I've forgotten some of the best ones. <laughs> Being 82 now, I'm, I'm sure I'm, my memory doesn't do all it should do, but... but. Uh, well, if you had to pick one or two words to describe, what, what would they be, and we'll close with that. Uh, integrity. He was, he was uh, a man of real integrity, uh, common sense, and uh, hard work. He was... Uh, I don't think he considered himself smart, but he was a very smart man and uh, uh, was uh, ahead of his time in many ways in terms of thinking about the future of the country and the state. Uh, but uh, honesty and integrity would probably be where I would go, okay. common sense. Well, we, I thank you very much for sharing your memories with me. Well, thank you for interviewing me and I, I appreciate the chance to talk about it my good friend and my boss, my mentor. Yeah.